Hey, and welcome to another episode where I interview innovative makers and entrepreneurs. And today we've got Sandy Antunes, author of DIY Satellite Platforms. And he's going to talk about his book and building sat and how you can actually build a satellite. So, Sandy, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. It's good to be here, Steve. <laughs> My pleasure. So, so tell us, uh, you, you recently wrote a book um, for O'Reilly Media, DIY Satellite Platforms. Uh, what is that book exactly? Uh, the book is the culmination of a series of mistakes, attempts, and home-built satellite building. The idea is I made all the mistakes so no one else has to and figure out how to build your own satellite in your own basement and documented it. That's really cool. So this is the first of four series? Right. The first one is about building the satellite, and then in the second one, about how to test it for rocket launch because and for space, because space is a hostile environment, vacuum is tough, but it turns out the rocket launch is where most satellites fail. So the second one's about how you can convert an orbital sander to a shake rig and how you can make a vacuum chamber out of a uh, pressure cooker and all the things you need to make a space test chamber in your basement. Really cool. So how did you get into this? Um, I was doing science writing. My background is as an astronomer, and I'd done some satellite operations for NASA for some time, but I'd never actually built stuff. And when I was doing science writing, Interorbital announced the $8,000 TubeSat kit. And so my thought is, wait, they're including a launch for $8,000 schematics and a launch. So for midlife crisis, do I want to get a motorcycle or build a satellite? Obviously, you know, I can guess how most of the people listening to this are going to decide also. <laughs> Um, and so when that happened, uh, I decided to see if we're really in a new space age where you can actually make your own personal satellite. And so I started making it in my basement and then documenting it. I called it Project Calliope after the muse um, because it's going to convert the ionosphere to music. Okay, cool. And, and so oh, it's, it's going to beam yeah. that down. Oh, that is awesome. So well, it's like going to the ocean, you know, you hear the waves. If you close your eyes at the ocean, you hear the waves, you get a feel of the ebb and the flow and what's going on, but we don't know that for space. So my thought is let's convert orbit to sound so people get a sense of the rhythm of space. Nice. So I mean, you because you obviously you have technical training, you're an astronomer, you're a science writer, but you didn't have hardware experience before this, but it was something that you could go down in your basement and actually build and learn and I don't think you're a dot com millionaire. I mean, you might be, correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, this is no, this, no, no. <laughs> this technology is so affordable now that someone who's dedicated could actually build an actual spacecraft. I mean, that's... Yes, and you don't even have to be that dedicated. It really is down to the hobbyist level now in terms of building it. Um, there's just so many tools, so much support in the maker community. Um, the schematics for the PCBs are out there. There are web companies that you send the plans to and they'll send you the boards. You know, this satellite has four main boards plus the instrument and each board you could get made by a one-off PCB fab for 40 bucks. So we're, we're away from the old, old day when you had to be an electrical engineer and lay out copper traces and dip things in baths and now it's like kits. It's you get the pieces and the job of the builder is designing and integrating parts that you can get and you know you've heard about 3D printers now if you want to make a payload that has a custom shape you can get a 3D printer and print things. So we're in a, you know, it's just a huge time to be a maker and everyone is already doing adventurous stuff with sending iPhones up in high altitude balloons. So let's just go one higher and actually go to orbit. Of course, yeah. So so how um, how did you decide to document all this? I mean, I'm sure a lot of people decide I'm going to build a spacecraft, but you actually said, okay, I'm going to do it, but I'm going to document everything I did. Is that just well, a science writer in you? Yes, it is the science writer and the teacher and the noisy part of me. Um, this, me doing it doesn't do anything except prove something to myself. But me documenting it means that other people can take what I do and make it better. It's the difference between playing guitar in your basement and then going out to open mic night or hooking up with a band. In one of them, you learn a skill. But in the other one, you're building something bigger than yourself and letting other people walk away and hopefully outdo you. Say, oh, yeah, that was great, but I'm going to push this even further. To which I'm like, yes, do that, do that. So has this become bigger than what you originally thought? You know, when, when you were like, I'm going to build it in my basement. Now it's a book on O'Reilly Media. Has it sort of gained traction and, and gone places you didn't think were possible? 
Well, I haven't gotten invited to a TED Talk yet, so I'm not going to say it's gone as big as I would like it to, but certainly gone um, at the level I've hoped to, which is that the maker community has gotten interested in it. And I've gotten criticism, I've gotten positive feedback, I've gotten people saying, oh man, you know, AMSAT already did that back in the 40s. I've gotten at least three other projects that said, wow, I was really inspired by your weekly build blog, and so we decided to do our own tube set. And one of them's building an ion engine, although he calls it a pulse plasma and gets upset when I call it a <laughs> ion engine. So, a pulse plasma <laughs> engine. And he's like, wow, you know, I'm following all the stuff you did, and you inspired me. I'm thinking, you're so much smarter than me. This is so cool. Nice. So, so I mean, this this spacecraft's built, you know, out of out of home out of home kits and PCB boards that are for forty dollars. How long do you think this spacecraft will last up up in orbit? Because I know it's you know radiation and all sorts three of three months nasty. tops. Three it's months. It's a tops? short. It's a short project. You'll probably get about six weeks, no more than three months. They're launching to low Earth orbit, uh, about two hundred fifty kilometers up, I think. So it's about four hundred miles. Um, the orbit will decay very quickly because you have a small irregular object tumbling, so they will ecologically uh, burn up and re-entry after a very short period. So this is about trying new technology and experimenting on stuff that then hopefully can you know move on to something new. I'm curious, if it were in a higher orbit, would the orbit be the limiting factor or the, the spacecraft components degrading in radiation? Good question. Um, a typical NASA mission used to use custom parts and then they realized it was cheaper just to use off-the-shelf high-end parts and NASA missions have a nominal life of two years but often go for eight or more. I think you could do oh yeah and also the AMSAT community has built some uh, larger microsats that have lasted over a decade so I think if you got a higher orbit you could definitely get several years even with home parts so I mean, so really, the limiting factor right now is the orbit you're putting it in, not the fact that you're getting off-shelf components and then they're degrading. It's it's things falling back from the sky. Yes, the orbit is the limiter for everything in space. Everything in space that we want to do is limited by getting up higher. If we can't get up high, we can't do anything. That's what drives your weight limit. Your weight limit drives the fact that you only have a certain power budget and you can only put a certain amount of instruments and you can only last a certain period of time. So that's why we need better rockets. Now, I'm not a rocket scientist, so I can't build a better rocket, but I can build a satellite. Very cool. So, so, so you, um, you're using the inner orbital tube sat kit, right? Is that what you're yep. using? How, um, and the little prop. <laughs> I love the prop. I love the prop. How, um, because I know they've been saying, you know, $8,000 a launch for a while now. Do you know how close they are to, um, to actually achieving um, their orbital mission? Uh, they're always about a year out. <laughs> and part of this is rocket science. I always joke that you know you can't send a rocket up until you've blown up enough rockets to prove that you know what you're doing and they're still in the uh, blowing up stage I understand that they have their FAA clearances to do some ballistic launches and they're doing tests with that and they recently about a month or two ago announced that they actually had a NASA contract to do some further research so they are getting a little NASA money which shows they've moved into a slightly bigger pond there um, and although they don't like when I say it, if interorbital is not the first cheap provider into space, someone else will be. They are one of several players. They're one of the noisiest. I love working with them. And they really get the open source uh, ethos and the idea of working with hobbyists and other people. So I really hope they succeed. But I'm also predicting that someone will, if not them, someone else. I, I know there's a, there's a new nano set. Uh, launch sat challenge that's out there and uh, I was at I was at Space Access 12 a while back and there's a couple panelists who were actually going to compete for it so it seems like there's a lot of people going for it so that's I mean I, I agree I think you know some some sort of nano launcher uh, will definitely bring back down the cost but I think it'll make it more possible for you know more people like you to build a satellite I mean $8,000 that's that's amazing yep it's about a factor of 10 cheaper than previous access now one thing I discovered recently as I became, as I started doing this more, I wanted to show you could do it even if you're not part of a university or a team, you know, really the lone maker. Yeah. But there are teams out there doing it, and it turns out that NASA and other people will broker a launch opportunity if you have a working CubeSat. So it's not that you get a launch and slot and then you build it like I am. It's instead if you build a, a CubeSat, um, there's 
several universities and NASA that will help you find someone that has spare room to put your CubeSat on. So I didn't even realize this. Most rockets launch with ballast, with wasted weight. Because, you know, if a rocket is built to launch 2,000 pounds and the payload is 1850, well, they're, they're, they have to put something in for that extra 150 to keep their calculations. So the fact that every rocket that's launching a satellite is sending up junk is just, you know, dead weight is just horrifying. But there are people that are brokering to try and replace that with PICO satellites, and there are opportunities now. And, and those are opportunities even for, you know, individuals, not necessarily universities or nonprofits. It's anyone with an actual working CubeSat. Anyone with a, a CubeSat who can get connected with the right people. It's still friend of a friend, and that's right. the barrier that, you know, I like that InterOrbital did. InterOrbital did the good old-fashioned capitalistic way. If you have the money, we will fly you straight out deal. I'm, I'm not good with the, the backroom dealing, and yeah. the this, that, and the other. They're kind of like the FedEx of, you know, hey, you just give us his money, and we will put it up there. Exactly. And the CubeSat community is more like the mafia. Hey, I know someone, you know, and they'll do a favor for you. <laughs> So um, one of the things I was really curious about was because I used to be an engineer. I worked for a defense contractor. I was a mechanical engineer. And one of the things they always stressed was ITAR, was the you know International Traffic and Arms Regulations. Mm -hmm. Was that an issue when you were posting all your stuff? I mean, I know a lot of it's off-the-shelf components, PicoSats. But, you know, was that ever an issue? Is that uh, something I was really curious about? Um, some of ITAR could be... Summarize as don't ask, don't tell. But uh, <laughs> yeah, no, there's. So I have many not. Issues. I have not run into any ITAR issues precisely for the reason you give. I am doing off-the-shelf, openly available materials. Um, that said, I'm trying to avoid ITAR and policy as much as possible because it's very confusing yeah. and it's very unsettled territory right now. And one of the issues with going with a broker like InterOrbital is that they are handling the mountain of paperwork. The joke is that you need to have a stack of paperwork equal to the height of your rocket before you can launch. And I heard that, yeah. So they're handling a lot of the uh, permission issue that when I give them the satellite and they check in and accept it, that's going to handle a lot of the permission issue. That said, there are things you cannot fly. Um, you cannot fly an imaging detector that points at the Earth without getting special permission. You cannot fly a broadcast device um, even for commanding or communicating with your satellite without negotiating spectrum with either the FCC or the international IARU for amateur. So there are some policy stuff that I have to step into. And some of these things that I'm either discovering or blundering into are, are why I'm doing the blog and the book so that other people can say, oh, okay, and be informed. Definitely. So, so uh, you're talking about like broadcasting. So, because your spacecraft is going to send a signal back to Earth, you have to get the FCC involved. Um, FCC, if I was doing it as for private spectrum, okay. but if I'm using amateur ham radio, which I am, then the IARU is the negotiating body, and you basically give them your launch window, and they negotiate out who's using spectrum. And a couple of the requirements are typically you'll get no more than 10% of any given orbit. So for a 90-minute orbit, you'll get maybe nine minutes of contact. Okay. And you have to be able to shut down your transmitter instantly if it's infringing in some way, shape, or form. So one technical solution there that I recommend people do is have your transmitter automatically shut down within any 10-minute period so that you have to actually activate it to turn on. That way you, you're not going to have a promiscuous satellite that's corrupting the spectrum. And uh, I just recently also discovered uh, something called GENSO, which is a ESA, European Space Agency sponsored network for PICO satellite communication. The idea is that you get hardware that matches their system, hook up to their server, and you get to use any other GENSO node that's participating to command your satellite as long as you make your antenna and system available to other satellite people. So there's really some interesting stuff growing now in the small sat PICO satellite realm. That's really cool. So there's a whole European communications network for, for satellites, for, for small a satellites. A worldwide one, actually, that has several U.S. universities and partners participating already. And it, it is for the amateur level space, you know, the amateur or the university level space. That's cool. And so there's no issue with you participating as an American citizen 
in uh, in the European network? Well, I know you. I know U.S. universities have participated. I don't know if I, as an individual, can participate. But that, that's one of the things that I'm doing some research on. So, so what's going to be harder, building your spacecraft or getting through all the regulations to build your spacecraft and to launch it? Originally, I thought it would be an engineering challenge that I'd have to learn a lot of engineering and a lot of fabricating and this and that. And it does turn out that the Figuring out what to do in the policy stuff is about as hard. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, because I actually talked with um, Michael Clive, who started a, the Mojave Makerspace. And one of the questions I asked him was, you know, is it possible to build space missions out of makerspaces? And what's interesting is he took the, the human side of it. He, he didn't really talk about the technology. It was sort of taken for granted that the technology's there, but it's really more of a, a human management. You know, it's like, can you organize people to do this? So we've kind of gotten away from the technology is the limiting factor. It's almost like the people and the policies is now what's holding us back. It is, and that's where the universities are stepping up. There are several universities that will do um, a balloon build, where they'll build a, a balloon payload in a weekend as a senior level project or similar things. There's some team-ups with Wallops uh, launch facility in Virginia for doing sounding rocket types of launches. Uh, Brown University recently announced they're open sourcing their plans for Pico satellite building and they're setting up a scheme. It's a, basically a xenon strobe so that people could see their own satellite and the idea is that anyone can do this. So yeah, it's become now a team and an organizing effort more than a technical challenge and I like that because that's what's going to uh, commoditize space in a good way. It's kind of like the early internet was only connecting some government and university sites and then everyone was able to get on through various channels and I think space is going to get to be that way and that's how we're going to get into space not with massive efforts but with lots of teeny efforts lots of I mean yeah and that, that's how HP Apple they were all built in garages and then they grew into into huge companies I, I definitely see key... it's just a really big garage <laughs> exactly. exactly well I mean you're building it in your basement I mean how cool would that be you know 10 years from now you've got a, a satellite business and it's like yeah started my business and now now I'm launching I mean because I see I see CubeSats and PicoSats as the shipping containers of space, where you've got the standard form factor, and it's basically anything that can fit in this form factor and weigh this much. We'll just stick it in a you know in a rocket and launch it up. I think that's a huge advance for space technology. It's also where we're going to get our next generation of engineers. Um, you know, hardware, either mechanical engineering like yourself or electrical engineers because now they don't have to be a rocket scientist. They can just take something like a, a basic X24 board or an Arduino board and figure out something that they want to try that you can only do in microgravity, in zero gravity, or a new space propulsion or a new detector concept and be like, okay, I can fly this. I don't have to worry about getting it there. I mean, imagine going with your FedEx analogy if to send a package, you had to actually contract, contact each driver and figure out all the mapping and all. It wouldn't have anything going. And, and the politics and you know what, what county you can and can't drive through and when you can do it. Yeah, it's a nightmare. So kind of going back to um, your project for a sec, what, what made you decide that you're going to take, that you're going to sample with the ionosphere and, and send back files? How did, you, how did you decide to do that particular uh, mission? <laughs> well, um, at the time, I was uh, wrapping up grad school because I worked for our time and I went back to get my degree late in life and I was talking with my grad advisor went into orbital announce and we were just brainstorming ideas to send into space and he came up with what was probably a million dollar idea which is to send up a satellite where people could record the sound of their farts and then send it back down to earth I thought that's great people would pay for that. that's wonderful that's not what I want to do and so I tried to think about what I wanted to do and I found a company in Canada called Infusion Systems that makes IQBX sensors for performance artists, um, people that want to do kinetic things that track movement or magnetism, and they also do some, some robotics people use it, but the idea of a sensor that converts magnetic field to MIDI data, which is, you know, what keyboards send out. Yeah. Or they have electric sensors and light sensors, and it all converts it to MIDI. And I thought, wait, what if you flew that in space? What if you converted all the space measurements and you did sonification to convert that into music instead so that instead of looking at a graph which 
it's not immediately obvious to someone that doesn't know the science behind it, you were hearing the pace of space. Because you know, we're hearing now about space weather, you know, space is a hostile environment, yeah. but we think it's very boring and still, and we don't have a sense of how active things are. And I don't know myself how active things are going to be in space. Is this satellite going to fly along and just every now and then, every you know, hour, there will be a solar effect? some noise, some flare of light, or is it going to be constantly popping with levels ebbing and flowing? It's going through the ionosphere, which is where the auroras happen. So I'm anticipating that every orbit, every 90 minutes, it's going to be going at least once through a region of high activity, and you're going to hear suddenly a huge ramp up, and you're going to think, wow, this is what the astronauts are going through as they go around space. This is what space has. It's not like the movies. It has its own natural rhythm. So when I found out, okay, there's a kit for the satellite, they're promising a launch, and there's off-the-shelf sensors that convert to music, it just sort of fell out from that. And so that's when Project Calliope Music from the Ionosphere came into being. Nice. So since you're getting about nine minutes of uh, radio time per 90-minute orbit, will you be able to uh, transmit the entire orbit, like everything you picked up, or is it only, only going to be enough time to transmit a portion of that orbit? I suspect only a portion of the orbit, so figuring out what chunks to sample. You know, um, if I'm just using the ground station of my house with a hand-pointed antenna, I probably don't want to always sample when it's over my house because that'll be the same thing every single orbit. So I'll probably want to have it choose different portions of the orbit and send down. And since it's still a work in progress, figuring out the data handling is still going to be an active part of what I'm doing. But the idea is to, you know, when I talk to musicians, because we're going to make it royalty free, so any musician that wants to remix it into a piece, it's like whale songs from the 70s. Any musician that wants to use it as ambient or as a track, they can put it in their music. Um, so I really only need short segments. A minute or two or three would be great. If I can get, ultimately, one full 90-minute orbit in piece, in, in pieces, just by sampling 10 orbits over the course of a couple weeks, I would be very, very happy. You know, one album. I'll get one album. <laughs> one album. Yeah, so, so when you want your next album, you have to launch another, uh, another spacecraft. I'm game. I'm game. So what are some other, other things that you could have done or that you've seen other people do with uh, CubeSats or PicoSats? Like what other missions can, are, are possible now? Um, wish I remembered what it was. I saw one team and they're trying to put an optical sensor in just to uh, see if they can do star tracking and acquiring the moon with a PICO satellite so they can practice spinning a satellite to acquire an object which would be great if you're trying to plan something to go to the moon well first you'd have to find it there's the brown group which are just sending a big strobe light so that you could track a satellite by the naked eye from earth which is a neat one there's the uh, I think it's slicer satellite where it's a single cube set that contains 300 one chip FM transmitters that will send a Sputnik like beep type message and they're testing the idea of one CubeSat deploying lots of even smaller satellites. Um, there are several people testing ion drives and pulse plasma drives, a uh, drive the size of a pencil that would fit on a satellite like this and actually give it a small, steady thrust. And I became uh, affiliated with a place called Capital College, and they had a, a team that for several years has been working on a concept called VelcroSat to use PICO satellites to look at orbital debris removal. The idea is if you have something like the uh, International Space Station, it has to reposition if there's some incoming debris. What if instead of repositioning, you could send out three or four CubeSats as a MIRV to intercept the debris and deorbit it for you? Could be a viable strategy for satellites. So prototyping orbital debris removal is another possible plan. So those are just some of the concepts bouncing around. And, and they're so much more affordable that you can try different ideas. Like, you know, maybe the Velcro sats don't work, but you're not out something and you're not out much money and then it probably gives you another idea for well this didn't work but we could try this instead and just keep iterating and, and trying different technologies exactly it's a cheap way to prototype and in the process the people building it are now suddenly becoming satellite builders which they can carry on so as, as you've gone through this I, I'm really curious about the new entrepreneurial possibilities by by these markers by by these markets, by you know makers and all these things, what kind of things have you seen, you know that that have popped up in the satellite maker community 
that you know new businesses have been built, new technologies. Uh, into Orbital, selling tube set kits for eight thousand dollars with the promise of a launch. Even if the launch doesn't happen from Into Orbital, I definitely got my uh, money's worth because that's the cost of taking a couple courses in satellite building. And I basically self-taught myself because of what they did. So that so they're an entrepreneurial outfit, most definitely. Uh, there's a marketing fellow in England that contacted me saying, what kind of marketing stuff could we do with a PICO satellite? Someone from uh, an international aid organization said, we have a problem with journalists being able to get their message out in remote areas. Could a PICO satellite help evade censorship? I'll leave it for you to percolate on some of the thoughts mm -hmm. that that might be. Look at the Pirate Bay in Sweden, and they're looking to fly blimps in order to boost uh, their ability to get the message out. Well, if you have someone that's willing to ignore licensing or is in a country with different licensing, you can start getting into the black hat area of it. So, I mean, the entrepreneurial part, I'll say, also has some cautionaries to say, it. Yeah, say. All policy is not a bad thing necessarily for space, but there's a lot of interesting things. And a lot of them, again, they go with marketing or communications, not just, you know, the science and engineering is a driver of technology, but it's not the thing that lets people cash out. Interesting. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate chatting with you. And uh, I'd love to see how this goes, so I will definitely uh, stay in touch. Yep, and I'll be writing. I was writing every week on the satellite, and then I uh, got a new day job, and so that put a hit into it. And so, you know, one caution is it takes more time than you think. But not as much time as it took two decades ago, so that's a win. <laughs> so where can we read? Where can we read your blog? Where can we find more oh, about your project? Uh, projectcalliope. dot com is where I write weekly about my own satellite build. And as you noted from O'Reilly Press and their Maker series, uh, we have the four books coming out that walk through how to build a satellite, how to have it survive in orbit, how to do communications, and what instruments will work in space. So. That's pretty much the full package, although just today I realized we need a fifth book, How to Put Rocket Steering and Attitude Control on a Satellite. So we'll have to find someone to write that one, too. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs>